down and then we were both like tumbling down the mountain and it was pretty pretty it was pretty vertical um on this ice um, cap and all i hear is dad shouting out jesus and then next thing i know i am trying to come to a halt i'm in crampons um skins come off and i'm in utter disbelief this is a dream this is not happening Welcome to Grow Your Dreams podcast. I'm your host, Shailen Fair, and today I have a special, beautiful guest with a fascinating story that's going to encourage you. But before I introduce her, I just want to encourage you to head over to Grow Your Dreams podcast on Instagram, drop us a little like, a follow, engage, let us know what you think of this episode, say hi to my guest and I over there. You can also watch this episode on YouTube at Grow Your Dreams podcast. As well as, won't you do me a solid favor and leave a review on Spotify or whatever platform you're listening on? That way, this show will be able to get out to more people. Good. <laughs> Welcome, Grace. Grace, you are a, an amazing woman. And that is why I wanted you here, because your story really fascinated me when I met you a couple of months ago. And also, you're just incredibly beautiful and intelligent. I still don't quite know how to describe your job, and I can't wrap my head around it. So I'm going to let you introduce yourself. Let us know a bit about you and what you do. Well, firstly, you're far too kind. Beautiful lady speaking right back to me. So thank you. Um, I am a English lady, but growing up in France, and I studied environmental science at uni, um, which leads me to become, after doing climate change um, mitigation as a master's, working in that sphere. And the title is environmental specialist. But essentially, what I do a lot of is feasibility studies and market analysis for emerging markets on where they stand in terms of uh, waste management services at municipal, national, subnational level, and how to create roadmaps to improve that, be it reduction of single-use plastics, be it stewardship of natural resource management, um, be it looking at how to do behaviour change campaigns to encourage people to try and live better, greener lives. Um, so you and also try and oh sorry yeah no no go ahead. Yeah, and, and my passion now, lately, having worked in the NGO field for years and now going into the business world, is seeing how large funding, which is available out there, can really help bring to the good international standards um, emerging markets so that they can get the funding they need to develop in a green, sustainable way. Okay, and if you are somebody who doesn't know what all these big words mean... <laughs> Can you can you describe your job for a five year old? I um, pick up dirty things on the beach, and I analyze them. Brilliant. And I tell people, don't drop your trash on the Fantastic. floor. Fantastic. And look lovely what you do. Wonderful. <laughs> that that makes a lot of sense to me. So thank you. Now that, now I understand what you actually do. Um, and and tell us a little bit about um just your your lifestyle and then go into how you've grown up and kind of your family dynamics. Got it. Um, right now I'm living in Cornwall, beautiful southwest of England, and on a daily basis I will try and cram in a sea swim. Um, I might, if there are waves, go for a little surf. Um, I really connect mostly to vibrating with being alive when I'm outside and um, I am one of four girls in the family so family is a huge thing for me as well and the rest of the family are scattered across the UK but quite close in Devon as well for some so I try and connect with family a lot daily and go meet them weekends. And did you grow up in England? No I grew up um, mostly in France and a little bit in China when I was a child. Yeah. And what took you there? To France and China? Um, yeah, well, my parents took me there. And um, when I was just under one, my parents moved to Hong Kong and then mainland China as missionaries. And they were university lecturers as well, language teachers. And then they moved to France when I was five to run a Protestant church, um, where is, which is where my mum still lives. So, um, so you're a PK kid? <laughs> and and what was that like as well uh, being in France was that like a crazy cultural shock 
I didn't like it. In hindsight, I'm very appreciative. Um, back then, I think in the north of France, in Flanders, it's very like dark Catholicism, I think, quite heavy. In what um, way do you mean heavy? We were, Sorry. Yeah, so um, we were the only English sort of Protestant family in the school. I think there may have been a couple of other years later, some, some of the kids from our church that came to that school but I went to a Catholic school where there was mass they you know once or twice a year they would do the parade of the Black Virgin Mary it's just quite um rooted in Catholicism which sometimes turned into spiritualism mm. I guess um and I was shielded from that but there was just a heaviness um yeah so you went to this yeah. Catholic school and what was it like growing up and being in that school environment as an English girl yeah, I mean, and in hindsight, it was probably the best school there in our small town. And because it was um, a religious school, it had great rules and great methodology. Um, we did have to attend mass once a week. Obviously, you know, didn't take communion and, and various things. As a British kid, I just didn't enjoy it because my identity, I struggled with finding who I was. Was I English? Was I French? Didn't feel French. Um, and there's quite a lot of racism in the north of France. Who would have thought yeah. against Brits? Um, maybe against me. I don't know. But um, in hindsight, though, I absolutely love France. And my upbringing was brilliant. Um, but, yeah. Okay. Good. So, <laughs> well, if you just go into your story about um, uh, just touch upon your relationship with your dad and kind of everything that went on there and then how... I basically just want you to unpack your faith journey and kind of the turning points for you and what, um, yeah, the different mountain peaks and dark valleys looked like. So I'm just going to hand it over to you to let you tell your story because I know there is, I was so encouraged by it and so encouraged by meeting you and your story is so fascinating. Um, so yeah, go ahead and, and tell us about your journey, your faith journey. Okie dokie, thank you. Um, well, both parents, um, very, very Christian. So I grew up in a very beautiful Christian Protestant bubble. Um, and I think, although my dad's father, so my, my paternal grandfather had passed away when I was about one in China, we'd never experienced any loss in the family. And there'd never been any big harrowing events or diseases. So it was this perfect little bubble, perfect little unit. And um, I think growing up, going to church every weekend and, sun, you know, um, on a Saturday, week meetings as well, was just quite a lot for me. And I am someone who's quite experiential. So I needed to feel and experience that it was true. And um, when I was 18, I went to uni and I thought this is my time to just put faith aside and just live a little. Not doing anything wrong per se, but just not going religiously to church and just experiencing life a little bit. Um, and when I was, yeah, so I, I did get to a church, um, a great church, but it was quite, um, I guess it's very man led. Um, and I was still having a lot of questions and I think I still had a bit of borrowed faith. Um, one thing that I really struggled with was that there was a constant calling for, you know, saving souls and you've got to look about where are you going to go if you die? You know, are you going to heaven and hell? But doing environmental science at uni, I was always like, well, what are we doing about heaven on earth right now? And are we protecting wow. and stewarding um, our environment? But fast forward to finishing uni. And um, so my father and I had always had this dream of we were we would always go on, on holidays mountaineering. And um, we had this dream of doing Mont Blanc in the Alps. And when I was 21, um, for my birthday, we decided with my uncle and cousin to, with dad, go and do this hike. So it was a three-day hike, and they'd gone on ahead a little bit to train and acclimatize. I was already in the Italian Alps, and I went to join them, and um, so we started the first day. We hiked up to the first mountain hut, woke up the next day, got ready to do the, the first big summit. And uh, my cousin started feeling a bit altitude sick. And so my uncle and cousin thought that we'll just turn back to the hut. Are you okay carrying on? 
So then my dad and I carried on and we walked for quite some hours, upon which, obviously, my very loving father was asking me tons of questions about uni, about life, and then how are you doing with your faith? And he said, you know, at the end of the day, you're telling me that you don't know if you get the butterflies, if you experience it, but it's also down to a step of faith and just making that step and God will do the rest. And making that step can also be really just like declaring in front of people, I want to be a Christian and getting baptized because our parents had never baptized us, it was free choice. And so I'd agreed, okay, well, I guess let's do, um, I will agree to do baptism class with you. Um, and we can have some conversations and see how that goes. We summit the mountain. My dad had already started feeling quite weak and it seemed to me like he hadn't really acclimatized properly or was just getting maybe hypoglycemic. So when we get to the top, he is a little weak, eats some food, a couple of other climbers come up after us and I ask them, can you just check on dad and see how he's doing? Is he strong enough? Should be okay, he's coherent. Fast forward to 10 minutes later, we start going down and because it's quite a high mountain, we were roped together and Dad was feeling quite weak. He started falling. That pulls me down. And then we're both like tumbling down the mountain. And it was pretty, pretty, it was pretty vertical um, on this ice um, cap. And all I hear is dad shouting out Jesus. And then next thing I know, I am trying to come to a halt. I'm in crampons, um, skin's come off. And mm. I'm in utter disbelief. This is a dream. This is not happening. And what is crazy is that dad had his helmet on. Um, I did not have my helmet on at this time. I should have died. And we fell a hundred and something meters and I'm in this gully and um, yeah, total shock, not sure what's going on. And basically what was happening was I was screaming at the top of my voice um, and dad was just hanging there. I couldn't see where he was, he was on the overhang. Um, and essentially maybe 30, 40 minutes go by um, and I managed to miraculously take the body harness off, go down, and he's upside down, head crushed, definitely dead. But at that moment, though, for, I don't know, it felt like 10 hours, but it might have just been 30 minutes. Um, that conversation with Dad about, you know, is um, God a God of love? Is he a real God? You're praying, and I, I'm, I'm desperately shouting to God and screaming at the top of my lungs saying, God, you know, at this time, Saddam Hussein is still alive and um, Ben Laden and all these horrendous individuals that have hate. You surely are not going to take my dad, who for me is my, um, you mm. know, ideal model of a loving, perfect person. Obviously, I go down, dad's died, um, make it off the mountain. And then, yeah, I just was in utter disbelief and I think in sort of robotic mode for years or for months. And um, following on from that, my amazing family were there, obviously, and no one blamed anyone, but my own sense of guilt for having the love for mountains and the love of the wow. outdoors, sharing it with my dad, shut down. And I was considering climbing for part of my career and doing outdoor stuff. And that, that was definitely a no-go because I didn't want to live. Um, now, I couldn't commit suicide because that would send my mother <laughs> probably to her early grave with heart um you know heart pain but I didn't want to live so I was just trying to find ways to you know slowly hurl myself and the worst was really just not eating well and, and developing a really bad food habit um and also twice getting drunk beyond recognition and my sister having to intervene um but after a few months, I still was in Exeter with her and going to church. And on the weekends, beautiful Christian friends would come and say, it's going to get better, which is yes. really wonderful. But it's also terrible for me because I just want to forget everything. Until one day, a visiting missionary from China, who was actually friends with my parents, said, hey, we're going to do a little talk about how things are going. By the way, we run an international school and we need someone to come and, um, you know, we need teachers. And um, how long after the event, what did this happen? This was about the China. Ten months later. Yeah, okay. So, I, so not too long after. And miraculously, I didn't break any bone, but I had a lot of wow. broken skin and stuff. So that was all healed. Um, but yeah, no. So it was almost an answer to prayer that I hadn't prayed. <laughs> but, 
um, yeah. I just needed to get out. I needed to get out of being close to family because that connected me too much to dad. Being gone from a, you know, Exeter was where mum and dad met. They got married. They went to uni there. Um, so yeah, anyway, moved to China in 2008. And it was a brilliant move. For two years I was out there. Whilst I was out there, I still didn't want to get any happiness. And it was a Christian school, but I had said to them, you know, I'm not going to be able to take assembly. I can't pray. And they said, no, no, it's fine. You don't need to do anything. What those two years taught me were um, incredible resilience through adversity, not through Mm. my adversity, but through colleagues and through other people. And I think, um, you know, God's always provided the last 14 years of my life with an amazing sort of net safety net of a bubble of the right people around me and there were various teachers on the uh, in the school a lot of them Filipino um brilliant strong Christians and um so many stories of you know one day a colleague told me that her cousin and husband and I don't know if it's six or seven kids had all been buried in a landslide alive um she never blamed God. She always she wow. grieved, but she didn't blame God. And to see that, I was in disbelief. No, no, hang on. So you believe in God and you're still praising God, but no, he's not a God of love. How can, how can he allow that? And the question why was the only main question I was asking, because at that point, you know, I was like trials and tribulations. You know, you read of Job and all his, his years of everything he lost, but this is not right. This doesn't happen in the Mm. um it doesn't happen today right it's not the old testament um no it does and it happened to many many stories one best friend i went to her wedding a few months later her husband um passes away after you know six hours of intense um acute appendicitis can't be resuscitated and, and that's it and yet she carries on with her faith and those really started making me understand that actually number one developing or growing up in a developed country in the West where things are quite taboo. You don't really talk about grief. You don't really talk about those things at home. And it's um, when it happens, it's horrendous, um, but it's shrouded. And then realizing mm. in developing countries where its emotions are a lot raw, they're on the surface, people talk about it. They experience it. And it's very, you know, climate change happens, accidents, flooding, other things happen. It's quite a, a normality for someone in your 10, you know, teenage years to have lost someone in your life. Um, so I think I started realizing that, but also most importantly, realizing that actually it's not God that allowed this to, ha- well, he, it's not God that dictated this to happen, but there are certain things that God does allow. And I continued for many years um, to struggle with that, but things got easier with time. And I think, um, The biggest struggle I've always had, I think, with misconceptions in faith and in churches also, is just God is a God of love. God is a God of goodness. There is evil in this world. And and reconciling that idea that actually the evil, like, you know, the devil is real and he will take over certain situations when God allows it. And we don't know why. Mm. And we'll never know why until we go to heaven. Um, But it's that there are so many things that happen in the world that we are not sure why they happen but there is a silver lining in it and God's grace and goodness is there and that took a long time to reconcile with but I'm getting there Mm. um it's a journey and um where I'm at now was that I think a decade of living in Southeast Asia where you're in the fast and furious pace um and 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 I was almost shoving everything under the carpet still a lot of Christian friends around me, but um, just always keeping busy. I was a social butterfly to ignore things and actually taking time to slow down, figure out certain broken relationships, figure out um, I don't need a relationship with an individual to compensate everything. I don't need to fix their problems. I don't need them to be a project, but what's going on in my life, I need to figure that out, be it religious um, sort of God connected or just there's a mishmash of things I need to sort Mm -hmm. out Um, and yeah just surrendering and David Chan's book Stop Praying was such a great well actually I think it's called Saving Grace 
but his first chapter is Stop Praying. Wow. And that was the Bible study group that my best girlfriends, my girl gang and I sort of met each other at, um, took me to. And I was always reticent. I can't pray. I can't mm. open up, but let's give it a go. The first day we're there, we open the first chapter of this new book. I think it's called Grace, yeah. And it's um, it stopped praying. And I'm like, huh, ir- ironic, because I can't pray. I already anymore. did that. <laughs> yeah. And the precursor of the chapter is really take a moment before you pray. Because you don't want to just say, thank you, Jesus, for this food or this and that. But actually, well, who are you praying to? What is this person or this entity? What is God to you? And reconnecting with his creation, what you consider this, yeah, this deity to be. And I had actually refused to believe in any deity or any social construct of a religion because I felt like I'd been shoved it down my throat all my life and I suddenly don't need it anymore. But this book allowed me to really reconnect to God and understand, okay, I'm understanding now who this saviour is and I still have such a huge journey to go, but his grace is enough and um, time heals um, trying to slowly get close to God and not having mm. expectations of what a Christian has mm. to look like and what um, it's not an equation that everyone has to have mm. to copy paste for everyone it's a personal private thing um, so yeah a few years on and now I just um, I, I think I still have a very strong faith and, and a family with an extremely strong faith we do it in a slightly different way I read my Bible, I do listen to church online, pandemic, but the way I connect to God the most mm. is actually outdoors. Um, and it's insane that I'm able mm. to connect to God that way. But it gives me joy and giggles and smiles and I could cry from one instant to the next when I'm outside because I feel this energy from God, which I never thought I'd get back. So that is wow. my journey. <laughs> It's, yeah, I mean, there's so much in there. I think one of the things that comes to mind is um, can totally relate with being in that place of almost not wanting to pray and shutting down because of, you know, grief and loss. Um, And it can be hard for the mind to come to terms with, this is reality now. And it can be such a shock to the system that it actually does I think it shocks you so deeply that it can shock shock your spirit so that it's hard to even like utter words to God. Um, I read a book, your book sounds very interesting. I'd love to read it actually, the one you mentioned, but I read one about silence, like silent prayer, um, which was very helpful and is still helpful and just to return to that place of silence. But um, one thing that helped me was... Um, uh, a, an old, older gentleman a pastor in his 70s I was just like I don't know how to do this relationship with God now after you know just just all these tough feelings and it was you know because I you imagine oh I should be waking up and praying for like an hour and you know ticking ticking all the boxes and I was so such a relief because he just said God wants our relationship with him to be easy he doesn't want it to feel like a burden and this heavy thing and it did just lift, you know, a heaviness off me just to have like a, um, yeah, a, a gentle relationship with him. He's not expecting us to jump through hoops, I guess. Um, but going back to your story, I mean, so your the conversation that you had with your dad before the turning point, was there, um, what, what, what has stayed with you from that conversation? And what have you been carrying? I think I have always been very experiential. I need to see, I need science to prove things. Um, And even back before my dad passed away, we would um, watch things from, I forget what the Christian group is, maybe creationists or something. And it's basically explaining science and huge climatic events, cataclysms that may have happened in the Bible, but also Mount St. Helen. Um, Things can be relatively unexplained. Science can actually prove that. But there's also a certain amount of the realm that we don't know, which Mm. is just the way it is. And um, I think understanding 